Welcome. I am a lay Shin Buddhist who nevertheless maintains an interest in the broader realm of Pure Land and Mahayana Buddhist teachings. My YouTube channel is called Akala Akala, that is A-C-A-L-A, A-C-A-L-A. In these podcasts, I make a non-scholarly, humble, and sometimes bumbling attempt to explore a particular topic or question related to the wonderful Buddha Dharma. I hope you find them to be of interest. With that said, let us begin. So, what will we experience when we're reborn in the Pure Land? What will our consciousness be like? What will we be doing? Shinran Shonen says that when we're reborn in the Pure Land, we immediately become a Buddha. And I think the concept here is that at that point in time, Having attained Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, we will have the option to become a Bodhisattva or to manifest ourselves as a Bodhisattva and come back into the world compassionately to help living beings. Well, if we elect to become a Bodhisattva at that point in time, who will be our model? How will we conduct ourselves? What will we see? How vast will be our vision and our commitment? to the Buddha Dharma, and to sentient beings' well-being. Well, our model here, I think, could be Samantabhadra, the Bodhisattva of universal virtue, the Bodhisattva of action. In the Avatamsaka Sutra, the Bodhisattva, Samantabhadra, makes ten great vows. And it's possible that when we're born in the Pure Land, we will replicate those vows. We will use them as a model for our lives. We will conduct ourselves in accordance with the path that the great Bodhisattva has laid out before us as a model. And of course, again, our vision is much broader at that point. What do we see? What do we experience? Well, in this podcast, is what the authors of the Avatamsaka, or Flower Garland Sutra, imagined would be the case when we have that broader vision and have that opportunity to follow in the Buddha's footsteps by taking the vows of Samantabhadra. Namumina Boots. There is an inconceivable number of Buddha lands filling up to ten quarters of the universe. Their number is indeed inconceivable as the number of atoms composing the earth. And there is an inconceivable number of Buddhas residing in these innumerable Buddha lands through the three divisions of time. And because of the virtue of Samantabhadra's life of vows, a deep faith is awakened in a Bodhisattva's heart, and he will feel as if he were in the presence of all these Buddhas, whom he will salute with his body, speech, and mind that are pure. And, dividing this one body into as many bodies as there are Buddhas in these innumerable Buddha lands, innumerable as atoms composing the worlds, he will salute every one of them. He will not feel fatigued in doing so till the end of the universe. The number of the Buddha lands filling up the entire extent of the universe and the three divisions of time is as numberless as that of atoms composing the earth. And in each one of these numberless Buddha lands, there is again as innumerable a number of Buddhas as that of atoms composing the earth. The Buddha is found surrounded by an ocean of bodhisattvas in every one of these Buddha lands. And a bodhisattva will present himself before each one of these Buddhas with a deep understanding and clear perception. The ocean of merits of the Tathagata will then be praised with a tongue far more exquisite and eloquent than that of Sarvasti, each tongue expressing a sea of inexhaustible voices, and each voice articulating a sea of words in every form possible. And this praising will go on without cessation till the end of the world, and as long as there is a being in existence, and yet a bodhisattva will never feel tired of his work. And a bodhisattva will also burn before every one of the innumerable Buddhas all sorts of oil, in such measure as compares to an ocean. But of all the offerings one could thus make to a Buddha, the best is that of the Dharma, 
which is to say, disciplining oneself according to the teaching, benefiting all beings, accepting all beings, suffering pains for all beings, nurturing every root of goodness, carrying out all the works of a bodhisattva, and at the same time not keeping himself or herself away from the thought of enlightenment. None of those material offerings above mentioned begin to compare with this form of moral offering, or dharma puja. The former are not equal even to an infinitesimal fraction of the latter. Why? Because all Buddhas are born of moral offerings of this kind. Because these are the true offerings. Because the practicing of the dharma means the perfection of an offering one could make to a Buddha. A bodhisattva will make these offerings without cessation to every one of those innumerable Buddhas till the end of the world, and as long as there is one being in existence, and in doing so he will never feel tired. Whatever sins committed by me, they are due to my greed, anger, and folly, and done with my body, speech, and mind. All these I now make full confession and repent. According to the Sutra, all these sins, if they were really substantial, are thought to have filled the universe to its utmost ends, of which a bodhisattva now vows to repent without reserve from the depths of his heart, vowing that such should never be committed again by him, for he or she will henceforth always abide in the pure precepts and amass every sort of merit, and of this he will never get tired, even to the end of the world." All the Buddhas had gone through untold hardships before they attained full enlightenment. Since their first awakening of the thought of enlightenment, they never hesitated to accumulate all the merit that tended toward the attainment of the goal of their life. They never raised a thought of egotism, even when they had to sacrifice their life and all that belonged to them. The Bodhisattva now vows to feel a sympathetic joy for all these doings of the Buddhas. Not only with the Buddhas does he this, but for every possible deed of merit, however insignificant, executed by any being, in any path of existence, of any class of truth-seekers. The Bodhisattva, with this vow, will never be tired of putting it into practice till the end of the world, and as long as there is one being in existence in this world. A bodhisattva vows to ask every one of the Buddhas to revolve the wheel of the Dharma, who are residing in these innumerable Buddha lands, filling up all the worlds which are indeed as inconceivably numerous as atoms of the earth. And further, the bodhisattva will ask every one of the Buddhas not to enter into nirvana if any is so disposed. He will ask this even of any bodhisattvas, arhats, shravakas, or pratyek Buddhas for he wishes these superior beings to continue to live in the world and keep on benefiting all beings. He will never stop in this request as long as there is one being left in this world. The Bodhisattva vows to learn from the life of a Buddha, who, in this Saha world, ever since his awakening of the thought of enlightenment, has never ceased from exercising himself ungrudgingly, not even sparing his own life for the sake of universal salvation. His reverential attitude toward the Dharma had been such as to make paper of his skin, a brush of his bones, and ink of his blood, wherewith he copied the Buddhist sutras to the amount of Mount Sumeru. He cared not even for his life, how much less for the throne, for the palaces, gardens, villages, and other external things. By practicing every form of mortification, he finally attained supreme enlightenment under the Bodhi tree. After this, he manifested all kinds of psychical powers, all kinds of transformations, all aspects of the Buddha body, and placed himself sometimes among Bodhisattvas, sometimes among Shravakas and Pratyeka Buddhas sometimes among Kshantriyas, among Brahmins, householders, lay disciples, and sometimes even among Divas, Nagas, human beings, and non-human beings. 
Wherever he was found, he preached with perfect eloquence, with a voice like thunder, in order to bring all beings into maturity according to their aspirations. Finally, he showed himself as entering into nirvana. All these phases of the life of a Buddha, the Bodhisattva is determined to learn as models for his own life. In this universe, life manifests itself in innumerable forms, each one differing from another in the way of its birth, in form, in the duration of life, in name, in mental disposition, in intelligence, in aspiration, in inclination, in demeanor, in garment, in food, in social life, in the mode of dwelling, etc. However different thus they are, the Bodhisattva vows to live in accordance with the laws that govern every one of these beings in order to serve them, to minister to their needs, to revere them as his parents, as his teachers, or arhats, or as tathagatas, making no distinction among them in this respect. If they are sick, he will be to them a good physician. If they go astray, he will show them the right path. If they are sunk in poverty, he will supply them with a treasure. Thus, uniformly giving benefits to all beings according to their needs. Why does he do this? Because the Bodhisattva is convinced that by serving all beings, he is serving all the Buddhas. That by revering all beings, by making them glad, he is revering and gladdening all the Buddhas. Why? Because a great compassionate heart is the substance of Tathagatahood. It is because of all beings that this compassionate heart is awakened, and because of this compassionate heart the thought of enlightenment is awakened, and because of this awakening supreme enlightenment is attained. It is like a great majestic tree growing in the desert, that it spreads out so luxuriously its stems, branches, leaves, flowers in all directions is due to the supply of water under the ground. So, with the majestic tree of enlightenment growing in the wilderness of birth and death, the roots are deeply planted among all beings, while it blooms out and bears fruit as Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. That these roots are well nourished is due to the pouring of the water of great compassion, without which there will be indeed no flowers and fruits of enlightenment as attained by Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Why? Because of the water of great compassion, all beings are benefited and perfected as to attain the highest supreme enlightenment. Therefore, enlightenment is dependent upon beings. If there were no beings, there would be no bodhisattvas attaining supreme enlightenment. Thus, the bodhisattva must have a good understanding in this. As he or she regards with impartiality the minds of all beings, he is able to perfect his great compassionate heart, and as he moves among all beings with this great compassionate heart, in accordance with their modes of living and feeling and thinking, he or she is able to complete his offerings to the Tathagatas. In doing this, the Bodhisattva will know no fatigue, even to the end of the world. Whatever merits the Bodhisattva acquires by paying sincere respect to all the Buddhas and also by practicing all kinds of meritorious deeds as already described, they will all be turned over to the benefit of all beings filling up this entire universe. He or she will thus turn all his merits toward making beings feel at ease, free from diseases, turn away from evil doings, practice all deeds of goodness, so that every possible evil may be suppressed and the right road to nirvana be opened for the gods and humans. If there be any beings who are suffering the results of their evil karma committed in the past, the Bodhisattva will be ready to sacrifice himself or herself and bear all the pains for the miserable creatures in order to release them from karma and finally make them realize supreme enlightenment. In this transference of merit onto another, the Bodhisattva knows indeed no fatigue to the end of the world, etc. Then concludes the Bodhisattva Samatabhadra. These are, O sons of good families, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva's ten great vows. 
With that, I will sign off by reciting the Nembutsu in gratitude for being embraced and accepted just as I am by Amida Buddha, never, never to be abandoned. Namo Amida Buts. Namo Amida Buts. Namo Amida Buts.